think about it. I wonder what Oprah's doing. How's she doing? I, I am living the dream. And I want you to live the dream because I'm not living the dream because I'm special. I'm living the dream because I was obedient to the call of the dream. So I want you to leave here today thinking about what is the dream for you? What is God's dream for you? What does the Creator's dream hold? So I was going to be the surprise and now I am surprised having to speak to all of you myself. But I feel a sense of joy about it because from the time I landed last night and hit the elevator, it's like the best family reunion you ever had. With all of the relatives you didn't know you had and a lot of the relatives you really, really, really like. That's what the Essence Festival feels like to me. And so just for a few moments on the empowerment stage, I wanted to leave you with hopefully some words of empowerment because often when I'm introduced, people say things like how many awards I've gotten, a lot of them, thank you very much. And they say, uh, how many years I did the Oprah show and all the accomplishments that go on people's lists. But because this is an empowerment stage, I want to leave you hopefully with something that you can take home that not only empowers, but emboldens you to live the life that God intended. Because this is what people don't know, because you can't tell everybody. I am who I am. One black woman, my hand in God's hand, trusting in that word, because that word never failed me. And I got to where I am, and I stand as I am, as Maya Angelou often says, and often said, and says in her poem to our grandmothers, every time you see me, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. Every time you see me, I come as one, but I stand as 10,000. So it's just not me standing up here. It's every, it's my mother, my grandmother, her mother, the mother before her, her grandfather, every uncle who prayed, every sister who cried, every aunt who sacrificed, those whose names made the history books, those whose names never could make the history books, who allowed me to come as one and stand as 10,000. So oftentimes when I walk into a room just as cool as you please, and I can't see another black face in a 50 mile radius, I stand and sit at the boards as one, but I'm bringing the 10,000 behind me because I not only know who I am, but I also know whose I am. And so anything you hear about me that feels good, sounds good, you think about, I wonder what Oprah's doing, how's she doing? I, I am living the dream. And I want you to live the dream because I'm not living the dream because I'm special. I'm living the dream because I was obedient to the call of the dream. So I want you to leave here today thinking about what is the dream for you? What is God's dream for you? What does the creator's dream hold for you? So often we spend our lives wishing and hoping and hoping and wishing and desiring things. This is what I know for sure. You don't get what you wish for. You don't even get what you hope for. You get what you believe. So what is it you believe and know to be God's dream for you? So I live in the dream. I'm living in the space of the dream. And dream's good. Dream's good. The dream is greater than anything that I could have imagined. You know, when I was a little girl, my father on Sunday mornings after church. He was a deacon, so he thought he had to say goodbye to every single person. We were the last car leaving the parking lot in the green Oldsmobile. 
and we would drive through the white people's neighborhood. And I used to dream the dream driving through the white people's neighborhood. We'd drive through the white people's neighborhoods and you'd see their fancy houses. Some of them had gates, but all of them had trees. And I remember when I first came to Baltimore, I met a friend. Hello, Baltimore in the house. When I first came to Baltimore, I, I, I made friends with a wonderful woman named Arlene Weiner. She was the wealthiest person I'd ever met. And I went to her house and parked in the driveway. There was a Corvette and there was a BMW and there was a Mercedes. I went, whoa, Arlene's rich. And at Arlene's house, once I got inside, I could see from her kitchen window six trees in the front yard. I thought, oh, rich people have trees. When I get rich, I'm going to get me some trees. I'm not just going to get me. Everybody want to get cars and pocketbooks and shoes, but I want me some trees. So as life would have it, I was standing in my kitchen window about three years ago in California making coffee in the morning and I was looking out the window and I saw the six trees. But listen to me. I was making, making, making the coffee. I saw the six trees. I went out on the porch to actually count the six trees. And this is what I noticed, that I could dream the six, but beyond the six trees, in my kitchen window are 3,687 trees. How do I know? Because I had them counted. I had them counted. As I said, I want to know how many trees out there. I dreamed the six. That's as much as my, 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 my small mind and my imagination could hold for myself. I dreamed the six but God can see beyond the six. Can see beyond the six because there was a bigger dream for me. And I'm here to tell you, there is a bigger dream for you, Essence. There's a bigger dream. And so the key, the secret, the magic is to surrender to God's dream for you. To quit fighting against and pushing against and disallowing against and resisting against and trying to tell the creator, the universal forces, divine intelligence, what you are supposed to do and get still and know for sure what his dream, the dream, is for you. Now, when I was about eight years old, I, was, I grew up in the church, and I was uh, going to one of those women's day, you know how we, we, had, we have church all day long. I, I've been to Sunday school, and then we're going to... And then afternoon, they were having a women's tea from the women's board, and they were having a tea. And the little girl that was supposed to be there to do a recitation uh, had gotten ill. And so they said to my stepmother, we need some a little girl. Can Oprah come back and do a recitation this afternoon? My stepmother said, yeah, I'll have her back here this afternoon. So this, you know, church ain't over to 1.30. So by 4 o'clock, I had gone home and learned to recite Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Now, it starts out, out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. I was reciting it and doing the pit from pole to pole. I didn't know what I was saying. But at the end of the poem, there is the stanza that says, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now my little eight-year-old brain didn't really fully understand the power and depth of those words, but they sounded good enough for me to write them down and put them on my mirror. And those words, I am the master of my fate, 
I am the captain of my soul, became a mantra for me. What it said is, I am responsible for the choices that I make in my life. I am responsible. I am responsible. So obviously, I grew up and was better able to articulate what those words really mean. And I discovered in physics class, those of you who remember physics, the third law of motion. You remember what that is? The third law of motion in physics says, for every action, it's called Newton's law, and it says for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So what does that mean? That means everything that you are putting out into the world, every action, bam, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It means no matter what you do, the energy of what you do, what you say, and most important, the energy of who you are is going out into the world, into your home, into your relationships, and that energy is always coming back to you. You are responsible for the energy that you are pulling out into the world because that very energy, bam, is coming right back to you every single time, whether you believe it or not, because it is law. It is law. It is law that what you put out into the world is coming back. Now, in our country and many countries all over the world, they call this the golden rule. They say, do unto others as you would have them. Do unto you. The truth is, whatever you do is already done. The truth is, so when I learned this, that I am, I am the person who gets to control what comes back to me based upon what I'm putting out. Miss Seely tried to tell y'all in the color purple. <laughs> Miss Seely said it best. Uh, ro ro roll Seely for me. Knock you up on. Everything you've done to me, already done to you. That's real. That's law. That's not just some words that Alice Walker wrote. That is law. Everything you try to do is already done. So when I figured that out, oh, what I'm putting out is what's coming back. Let me get real clear about what it is I'm putting out. Real clear. So I read a book about 1989 called Seed of the Soul. And in that book, Gary Zukav talked about the laws of karma, of the laws of cause and effect, the third law of motion. And in that book, he talked about how intention, your intention is always one with the law. Meaning, before you even think about a thing, you have an intention for the thing. And that the intention is going to determine the outcome. That's why the same people can go to the same church service and somebody walked down the aisle just to be seen to put some money in the church. And somebody else who just goes and just has a little bit to offer. The intention with which you give, the intention with which you serve determines the outcome. So when I figured that out, I went, whoa. I changed everything I did on my show. I called in the producers and I said, from this day forward, I will no longer be speaking to the KKK. I will no longer be speaking to people who are fighting each other in a way that it is damaging to the character of myself and other people who watch. From this day forward, I am only going to do intentional television. And they're like, how are we going to do that and still win? The reason we remain number one for 25 straight years. Yeah. 
is because every single day I would have a pre-show meeting and have the producers come in and state to me, what is your intention? How do we want to use whoever is on this show, whatever is happening on this show, to serve the audience in a way that fulfills the mission of uplifting, enlightening, encouraging, as well as entertaining. And if it doesn't do that, then I can't do it. I can't put my name on it. So, I use this principle of intention for everything. I don't do anything without thinking about what is the real reason? What is the real motivation? What is the energy of my intention that's going to go into my thoughts and action and then be returned back to me? It is law. It's law. So the very first time I practiced this principle, there was a woman on the show whose daughter had been murdered by her boyfriend. And I went into the green room. I said, I'm going to see if this works. I said, can you tell me what's your intention? She said, I said, tell me what's your intention in being here. And she said, what do you mean? I'm here because your producers asked me to come. I said, but what is the reason you said yes? What did you intend when you said yes? And she said, I wanted people to know. Everybody asked me about my daughter's death and how she was murdered by her boyfriend. But I wanted people to know that my daughter was a real person. My daughter was loved and she loved us. I want people to know that my daughter had a life that goes beyond her death, that's bigger than her death, that her life was bigger than her death. I said, okay, I can help you with that intention. Let me tell you what I intend. I intend to literally exploit your daughter's life, to tell the story in such a way that every other 16-year-old girl who is being abused by her 18-year-old boyfriend will see themselves in the story of your daughter. They will hear that she had a life. They will hear that everything seemed normal on the outside, but see themselves in her story and be able to be empowered by the life and death of your daughter. So every question that I ask you is not me trying to, to be just a voyeur. I'm using it for using and asking the questions explicitly for a reason, for an intention to get people to see themselves. That is the first show I won an Emmy for. And I will say that this principle of intention I use in every thing. For the last interview that I did with Whitney Houston, we did the, hey girl, how you doing? Oh my God, oh my God, good to see you, so, so, so. Then I say, turn the cameras off. I say, Whitney, tell me, what is your intention? Why are you doing this interview? Why did you want to sit with me? What is it you want to happen at the end of these two hours? Tell me what it is you want because I control the mic and I can make sure that happens. And I've used that principle for every area of my life. I don't do anything and I ask that you consider not doing anything that you don't truly intend. Do not allow yourself to be marginalized and defined by other people's agendas and intentions because the power of your story lies in your personal intention. So it is my intention, my intention to fulfill the dream of the creator. It is my intention to live to the highest calling and be pressed to the mark of the highest calling that I have come to do. And when you can ask the creator, ask that which made you you, what is your dream for me? I guarantee you, instead of you trying to define the dream, what is your dream for me? If you're able to lean into the dream that the universe and all the forces of 
of, of, of light and love and power and grace by all the names that we call God has for you. Nobody can touch you. Nobody can touch you. That is the power of your phenomenon. Now, everybody works hard and everybody has their own dreams. There is, there was a time where I used to spend a lot of energy wanting things, wanting things. Of course, it's easy for me to say, oh, things don't define you because I got a lot of things. Things are nice, I like them. But this is what I learned. When you can surrender to the dream, you get to live in the space of the higher power. You get to live in the space that you purposefully have come to earth to claim for yourself. So around 1984, I was sitting in bed one morning, uh, Sunday morning, should have been in church, but I wasn't. I was reading the New York Times review of The Color Purple. And I thought, whoa, this sounds like a really great book. I got out of bed in my pajamas, put on my galoshes, and went to the store to get the copy of The Color Purple. I read The Color Purple in one afternoon, got, went back to the bookstore, bought every book of The Color Purple. I took the books to, to the office and I said to everybody, y'all gotta read this book. Oh my God, you gotta read this book, Color Purple. I needed a book club, I didn't have one. Uh, so I pass out the book to everybody I knew. Please, read The Color Purple, read The Color Purple. Then I start to hear that Somebody's going to do a movie about the color purple. But I don't know anybody in the movie business. By this time, I was on AM Chicago. I don't know anybody. I start praying to God. God, please help me find a way to get into color purple. <laughs> I say, Jesus, I don't even have to have a speaking part. I will be, because I went to the movies and I saw on the movie credits, at the last credit, there's something called Best Boy. So I said, Jesus, if you just let me be best girl, that'd be all right by me. I can be best girl. I can carry the script. I can help the people with the water. I can do whatever. So I start praying for the color purple. As, as divine law would have it, Quincy Jones comes to Chicago, and he is in Chicago for one half of a day because somebody has filed a suit against Michael Jackson claiming that Billie Jean was their lover and that's not his song. <laughs> so Quincy had taken the red eye to Chicago. He was in his hotel room. He was coming out of the shower and the television in his hotel room is on AM Chicago. There sits little chubby me with my Jerry Curl on AM Chicago, Quincy Jones tells Reuben Cannon, the casting agent, I think I found Sophia. So I get a call from Reuben Cannon who says, I'm calling about a movie. It's called Moon Song. Would you be interested to come and audition? And I say, I have not been praying for Moon Song. <laughs> no. I had not been playing for Moon Song. I've been praying for the color purple. He said, well, I think you should come and, and, and audition. So I go to audition. You know, movie people, they're making everything all secret. Steven Spielberg didn't want anybody to know he was doing color purple. So on the outside of the script, it says Moon Song. But I know all the words by heart. <laughs> so when I open the script, I know this is the color purple Jesus. This is the color purple. Yes. So I auditioned for the color purple. I can't even believe it. They don't just want me to be the water girl or the best girl. They are asking me, do I want a part in the movie? Oh, that, that, I'm thinking prayer, prayer works. Prayer works. But listen to this, three months pass. Three months is a long time. I auditioned in February. March, April, May comes. I haven't heard anything. So I call Reuben Cannon. I say, Mr. Cannon, 
I'm sorry, sir, I haven't heard anything. I expected to hear something by now. And Reuben Cannon, African-American man, says to me, you don't call me, I call you. And I didn't call you. Do you understand that I have real actresses who have auditioned for this part? Real actresses. And he tells me who just left his office and I went, well, okay, I'm not getting that part. So I hang up the phone and I start crying. I can't believe that God has played this trick on me. I think this is a trick. So I decide that this is because the fat has finally caught up with me. The fat has finally caught up with me and now I must get rid of the fat in two weeks. I am going to go to a fat farm and I'm going to lose 25 pounds. I'm gonna drink a lot of green juice. I'm gonna have some cleanses and colonics. So I, I, I also was trying to make peace with it. I said, God, I don't understand. I thought it was for me. You ever had that talk with God? I, I, I thought it was for me. I thought it was for me. God, you let me audition with somebody named Harpo. That's my name backwards, Jesus. That was a sign, wasn't it a sign? And then three months pass, and then, then Reuben Cannon says, real actresses have just left his office. So I start to pray on the track. I'm out on the track at the fat farm, and I am running around at the track at the fat farm. It starts to rain. Y'all know how that is but I don't even care because I am praying to God to help me to let it go. Help me let it go because now I've become obsessed with it and it's now controlling my life. I start praying, running around the track. And I keep hearing this noise and I... I can't, there's nobody on the track but me, and I'm running around the track. And I look around, and it is my thighs rubbing together. It's my thighs. My thighs are rubbing together causing this thunderous sound. There's nobody on the track. So then I really start to cry. Oh Lord, help me. Help me let it go. Help me let it go. Help me let it go, God. Help me let it go. And you ever did this prayer where you say, okay, Lord, okay, I'm gonna let it go. Then you get up and you go, well, I think I still got a little bit of it. I did, help me let it go but I am not gonna be able to see the other actress in my part. I won't be able to see it. I won't be able to see Color Purple. Just can't never see it the rest of my life. I won't be able to see it. So then I started, I don't know where it came from. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I sang and I cried. I sang and I cried and I prayed some more until I could reach the point where not only, not only will I be able to go to the movie, but I can bless the other actress. I can bless her. I can say, I bless you. I bless you. I bless you with this. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. And I tell you, 
in my greatest testimony that the instant I laid that thing down, I'm telling you, when I laid it down, when I laid it down and it didn't have me anymore, it had no control over me anymore. I didn't feel anything about it anymore. When I let it go, when I intentionally surrendered it to the power that was greater than I could ever know, the instant that happened, a woman comes running out of the cafeteria screaming, Ofri? Is your name Ofri? For 10 years, nobody could pronounce my name. I said, yeah. She said, somebody's on the telephone for you. He said, his name's Spielberg. I get to the phone. He says, I hear you're at a fat farm. I said, no, sir. This is a health retreat. He says, I'd like to see you in my office in California tomorrow. This, is, this was in Wisconsin, I was. I'd like to see you in my office. And if you lose a pound, you could lose this part. No problem do I have. I don't have no problem not losing a pound. So, honey, I packed my bags and I stopped at the Dairy Queen. I got three scoops just in case I'd lost half a pound. <laughs> and the next day I was in Steven Spielberg's office and he said, you're hired, you're hired. You told Harpo to beat me. All my life I had to fight. I had to fight my daddy, I had to fight my uncles, I had to fight my brothers. Girl, child ain't safe in a family means. But I ain't never thought I had to fight in my own house. I love Hoppo. God knows I do. But I kill him dead for I let him beat me. Woo! You dead son of mine, Miss Celia. You keep on advising him like you do. This life be over soon. Heaven lasts always. Girl, you ought to bash Mr. head open and think about heaven later. <laughs> Woo! The color purple was a life-changing event for me because it taught me that you can dream the dream and that God can have a bigger dream. But most importantly, it taught me the power of surrender. It taught me when you've done everything you can do. You don't just have to stand. When you've prayed and cried and stood and tried some more and sacrificed and wanted and dreamed and held on and believed and got turned down and turned back and turned around, it taught me that when you've done Everything you can do, surrender all. Surrender all. Because there's a bigger dream. There's a bigger dream waiting for you, just waiting for you to step into it. To step into it. Your life is big. Your life is huge. And we spend so much time wanting 
to be in somebody else's life. And you don't get honored, you don't get revered, you don't get celebrating wanting what somebody else has. Because that which created you, divine intelligence that dreamed you from before your ancestors ever knew they would become your ancestors, that which dreamed the seed of you wants you to know how special, how wondrous, how mysterious, how complex, how glorious, how phenomenal you are. And you get no credit messing in somebody else's territory. Or trying to have power over something you have no control. Another one of my favorite teachings is the Wizard of Oz. When the witch, Wicked Witch of the West says, go away from here because you don't have any power here, you have no power in any territory other than your own. Oh, but you are the master of that. You get to be the master of your own fate. You get to be the captain of your own soul. And if you just manage that, if you just took care of your territory, oh, the glorious, 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 wondrous, wondrous opportunities and possibilities that are waiting for you. So the question is, what are you resisting? What are you pushing against? What are you not allowing? What are you blocking? Because you have this idea of who and what you're supposed to be instead of leaning into the dream that's already been created and waiting for you. It's waiting for you. And the second, I mean, it doesn't, it's an instant thing. It's a shift in the way you see yourself and the power from which you have come. So I went through some tough times after, after I left the Oprah show. I made a conscious decision that I did not want to be sitting on TV with the Oprah show and y'all saying she should have left that show. <laughs> that show was really good two years ago. I made a conscious decision, decision that when I felt I had said all that I could say and the audience had heard it, that I would move on and that I would not spend my life regretting or trying to hold on to what used to be or hold on to what I had. So I dreamed this dream of starting a network. And in the beginning, it was, it was a struggle. It was a struggle because I didn't, I, honest to goodness, I did not know what I was doing. I was trying to figure it out. I was trying to figure it out. I thought that the Oprah show audience would follow us to own, and then I realized y'all didn't have cable. And if you had cable, you did not have the own package. So, so it took me a minute. And unlike most people who you get to have your mistakes in private, some don't go right in your life, you get to sulk about it in private. If I make a mistake, it's on the CNN crawl or the CNN news. So when I was in the climb and there were so many wonderful owners, I see Churl Action Jackson here. There were so many wonderful owners, people who said, oh, we're gonna stand with you. We're gonna stand by you. Thank you, Roland Martin. There were so many people who said, listen, we believe that this can happen. So I dreamed the dream along with Tyler Perry, who was my friend who came to me and said, Tyler, Tyler said, I'm gonna help you out because Tyler can go home and write a script and direct it, produce it and shoot it and do it for less money than anybody in Hollywood. So we started with the foundation of have and have nots. If loving you is wrong, love thy neighbor, Mama Hattie. And then I started to dream another dream about scripted television, because in the beginning I was told you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it, didn't have enough money to do it. And I dreamed the dream. 
I read Proverbs 11:28 that says, "Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will rise and thrive like a green leaf." Ooh, ooh.